Hi, my name is Jason Carrillo, and I've been teaching English for 13 years. I basically correct people's grammar mistakes all day, every day. It's a great gig for a word nerd, right up my alley. It was either teach English to non-native speakers or teach my friends and family to hate my guts. A lot of Vancouverites take it for granted, but for visitors and immigrants to Canada, our multicultural environment is unique, with English being the lingua franca of international business, trade, politics, entertainment, you name it. We're pretty lucky to speak it as our first language. As an instructor, I find many questions of grammar and structure to be somewhat easy to tackle. I do it all the time, every day. Here's a rule, I say, a formula. Uh, and because English is a language of exceptions, I also have to say, here's a list of 10 to 12 cases where that rule doesn't work. Certainly, between literally hundreds of rules and exceptions, second language learners can get mighty frustrated. We native speakers spend a lifetime learning when to say what. Uh, any of you have young children? You know how often they say why. The most common lament I hear from advanced students is, quote, I understand my teachers, I get good scores on my tests, but when I go to the movies or talk to real people, I still feel like a beginner. And it's not grammar or vocabulary that hamstrings them. It's something called reduction. In broad terms, reduction is a way to make spoken language move faster. We teach, where are you going? And did you see the game last night? To beginners. But in genuine communication, it doesn't sound like that. Where are you going? And did you see the game last night? The most common form of reduction is changing a vowel sound to something called a schwa. It's a neutral vowel sound made when the cheeks, tongue, and palate are all in relaxed positions. Contrast you with y or the with the. We don't say reduction, which sounds Spanish. We say reduction. In fact, one of the first things people notice about foreign accents is when speakers put the wrong emphasis on the wrong syllable. Uh, in English, we reduce unstressed bits of language, so knowing where to put your schwas is pretty important. Notice it's language, not language no matter how it's spelt. In longer words, uh, reduction means identifying the emphasized syllables and reducing others to schwa. This usually is determined by the suffix. The ending of the word mandates a different stress. Photograph, lithograph, autograph, photography, lithography, biography, photographic, lithographic, biographic. English, for the most part, is a syncopated language. If you've ever studied music, you know that means every long note is followed by a short one. Da, 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 da. So, we make short notes in the words schwas. Photograph. Photography. Uh, photographic. If that wasn't hard enough, now we need to consider information words versus function words. In a given sentence, some words are just there for structure. They're the nails in a building frame, or the thread holding the hem on your pant legs. Uh, if I say, maybe, can, a few, please, for, do you understand what I want to say? No. So these words can be reduced. If, however, I say, you buy bananas me, it's not structurally correct, but you get the idea. Uh, these words, the information words, shouldn't be reduced. Put information and function together, and you have a grammatically sound sentence. Just remember to reduce the function words. Maybe you can buy a few bananas for me, please. This is illustrated really well with simple questions. What do you want to read becomes what do you want to read. There are a million possible combinations of information here. Uh, just change the question word, and the answer must change as well. So it needs to be pronounced clearly. Who do you want to read? Where do you want to read? Why do you want to read? When do you want to read? How do you want to read? Switch up the verbs, you've got thousands of possible questions, all with the same three function words reduced to schwa. Who do you hope to see? Where do you need to go? When do you plan to leave? Uh, how do you manage to survive? The past tense questions sound so similar, it's almost unfair for non-native speakers. Compare why do you have to quit to why do you have to quit? We recognize the difference between d and j without a second thought when we're native speakers, but these poor folks, wow, they just, they have a hard time. And I haven't even gotten into ing endings. 
Your Japanese waiter and your Iranian neighbor probably ask, how are you doing? With a big smiling ING at the end, where Canadians and Americans ask, how you doing? Uh, Aussies, of course, will say, how you going, just to mix it up. It's all very, very difficult. So what does it all mean? For learners, it means immersing oneself in the culture as well as the classroom. Uh, from what you talking about, Willis, to uh, how you doing, no soup for you, to may the force be with you, English is littered with popular culture references. It also means leaning hard on questions. While a lot of people are afraid to admit when they don't understand something, the most successful learners straight up say, what does that mean? Even native speakers ask, WTF, is that? Is, is that even a thing? What is that? For English native speakers, observing how often we use schwas can provide a little more insight and maybe even patience with the errors and misunderstandings that foreigners uh, who speak English or kids or coworkers who struggle with spelling and pronunciation. When we live in an English-speaking environment, reductions are all around us. I, I use five schwas in that last sentence alone. For English speakers, reductions save valuable time and muscle fatigue. For people learning it as an additional language, they cause mistakes, misunderstandings, and stress. No amount of vocabulary memorization or grammar practice can fix that. What will? Awareness, patience, and immersion in the culture of schwa.